Hey, fanboy nation. This is your pal Daffy Duck, and you're watching. You're watching. We're watching. You're watching. Fanboy. 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 A fanboy, etc. Fanboy nation. Dot. I assume. Uh, um. <laughs> This morning, as Nisreen is about to premiere on Hulu, I have the chance of speaking with the filmmakers, Jeff Kaufman and Marsha Ross. How are you two today? Good. Good. How are you? Good, thank you. Thanks for inviting us. Well, it, it's a very important story. Um, you know, it, what was it, 11 years ago? No, 12 years ago at this point. Uh, Iran almost had another revolution. And a poor young woman named Netta was shot in the throat in the middle of protests in Tehran. The world was focused on Iran and, you know, the chance for Neda, for Neda, for Neda came. Then Michael Jackson died and the entire world went from Iran to, to California and forgot about it. And the revolution was squashed. Now we have a... Uh, a Another thing to blame on Michael Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> More so the doctors that didn't save him, apparently, at this point. You know, we, could, we can blame a million people for that one. But, you know, Iran lost a chance at another revolution. And, yes, now, they did. and now we have, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, Nasreen, who is a political activist who remembers the Iran of the Shah, which although several of us, my father was born in Iran, and I know his generation and everybody uh, prior, you know, although wasn't in love with the Shah, you know, always said it was better than what it became in, in after the revolution. What does it mean to you to sit there and see you know, the Iran of the Shah versus the Iran of the Islamic Republic and how things have changed from 1979 to 2021. And now there are people like Nasreen still fighting for this because it's a very dangerous situation for her because her husband and children are still there. Well, first of all, I think, you know, we were joking about Michael Jackson, but you point something really, really important, which is that um, our sense of history and our focus on events just slips away so quickly. You know, so something significant happens and then there's eye candy someplace else and we forget. So um, separate from Iran, uh, Americans have very little understanding of our own um, really um, dangerous and destructive interference in Iran over and over and over again. Uh, and, um, and, and so events don't just happen on their own. They happen because there's a chain of events on both sides of distrust and betrayal uh, and, and, and abuse. And uh, you mentioned the Shah. Obviously, most of this film focuses on the time uh, after the 1979 revolution. But I remember being in New York when I was very young and seeing anti sabak demonstrations on, on Times Square. Uh, and people uh, lined up, uh, not Times Square, I'm sorry, Fifth Avenue. And, and uh, people lined up on Fifth Avenue demonstrating the tortures of, of the Shah Sabak uh, and, and being really um, hit by that. And that was right before the revolution. So um, <sighs> This is a documentary that's about a real hero, Nazarene Sotadeh, a mother, an activist, uh, someone who has uh, put her life at risk for religious minorities, for journalists, for artists, uh, fighting against the death penalty. Um, but it also is a reminder of uh, this complicated world and, and, and how um, we've been in this sort of cycle of, 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 of betrayal and distrust. One of the things we want to do with the film is break through all these stereotypes that we have about the Iranian people. And even though we criticize the regime, show how vibrant and rich the culture is and, and, and how good so many of the people are as well. And so, Nazreen too, you know, people ask, I mean, she, you know, she has, still has hope for the future. I mean, that's why she does what she does because she wants to make the world a better place for her children and future generations in some, in some way. I mean, to get, you know, with the, the freedoms, you know, that they, they've lost. And it's, it is very, it's very, very scary, you know, to see the repression there. It's just, it's really difficult. Yeah. Uh, certain things that have happened, whether we want to blame Jimmy Carter, whether we want to blame XYZ administration post Carter, whether we want to blame the British ma magistracy from the 1950s and everything that started off over there, we come to a point now where, as I mentioned with Netta, you know, once all eyes shifted from, from Iran with a potential revolution that was squashed, someone like her that is still an activist and still pushing for reform 
And I don't know whether it would be within the Islamic Republic or need a, a silent revolution or even a full-fledged violent one, which God forbid, I hope doesn't happen. Um, Cause you know, we have enough deaths in this world through, through violent tragedy. Um, what it, it's, it speaks to her character and the strength of her husband and family supporting her. But what's the mindset, especially with her now being in prison, um, you know, the safety of the children, the safety of the husband, you know, is there possible escape through Turkey and then going either to Europe or the United States or Australia or somewhere else? It's a profound question. Um, uh, and I know that this is something that Marcia has thought about a lot as well. Why does Nazarene stay in Iran? She's determined to stay in Iran and fight her nonviolent fight um, as, as far as she can take it. Uh, and by the way, that's a struggle that she's taken into prison as well. She was, she was arrested in she was held for three years in prison from 2010 to 2013, um, and then arrested again in June 2018 while we were filming. It wasn't because of our filming. In fact, she was in the middle of this historic uh, um, women's rights movement in Iran called the Girls Revolution Street or Ingolab Street, uh, where women would uh, go out in public, stand on a box, take off their mandatory hijab, the headscarf, put on a stick and wave it, and risk 10 years in prison for that simple act. Nazarene became the leading spokesperson for those women and, and, a, and a defender in courts of those women as well. And because of that and some other things, she was arrested and, you know, as you know, sentenced to 38 years in prison and 148 lashes. She was held into being prison for years and then she was transferred to Garchak prison where she got COVID. And Garchak is just this foul pit of a prison that's disgusting. Um, but um, as I was saying, even in prison, it's just amazing, even in prison, she kind of goes toe to toe with the regime and uses uh, her public uh, position to advocate for other prisoners uh, and for improvements. And, uh, and, and she, that she doesn't, she won't leave the country. She loves her children. She loves her husband. They're amazing. But uh, she feels like um, this is her calling. This is what she has to do. Yeah. I just to add to that, uh, you know, that you're right. I mean, she could have left after her last imprisonment, but she doesn't want to. And I think not, you know, she has tremendous purpose in life, which, you know, when you meet someone like that, it's it's transformative. A person who has that much purpose, it, it sort of triumphs everything else. Uh, and her family, you know, supports her, as you know, in every every way. And, and she's also a role model, you know, for people there, you know, that she inspires other activists to, you know, to, to do things. And I think if she left the country also, she, she, I don't, you know, I don't, she doesn't want to, she, she's, her presence does engage other people. And also, you know, it's interesting, you just talk about Iran, the country, and I, I don't know the situation, you know, with your dad, but one thing for us, you know, making the film and meeting so many Iranians who, um, you know, have had to leave Iran, you know, they didn't, they had to leave. I mean, not just, you know, after the Shah, but people who were, you know, scientists and doctors and lawyers and journalists because they would into prison or die in prison. So they went, you know, they live in exile and they worry about the rest of their family there. They can never go back because they would end up right in prison again. And one thing we wanted to capture you know, in the film is that Iran is also a really beautiful country. The Caspian Sea and the mountains and the longing that we discovered in people to show the ch their own children you know, where they grew up or return to see their family. And they can't. And I think you know, that's a really difficult thing you know, when you love your country, but it's too dangerous to live there. And especially when it's such a, it's a beautiful place. And I just wanna add one last thing that one of our goals too with the film, Jeff touched upon it, is that you know, we're talking politics a bit because that's what most Americans, you know, we read the newspaper, like you're talking about. My, probably my first awareness of Iran was 1979 with the hostage crisis. But, and I'm an avid reader of the news but many people aren't or what they read, you know, it's very curated to only, oh, they're having the nuclear court talks or, you know, they just bought some ship did this or that or whatever. And what happens is you don't realize that that's just government to government. I mean, there's a whole lot of people there that are wonderful, generous people. You know, we share a common humanity, all of us, that is separate from, you know, government machinations. And I think that was really, really important for us to, to capture in the film. Um, we've done this even pre-biblical times. Uh, if you go back into ancient history, you show 
X group conquered another group. Uh, if you even read the Bible itself, you know, they're the children of, uh, of Israel versus, and then you find out it's their cousins. These are Esau's children, and those are their descendants. So you have to be nice to them, but they're not necessarily in the family because they're not part of the immediate family. And this has been going on ever since the expansion of city-states from Mesopotamia into Greece and so on and so forth. Um, so it's kind of been tradition to, yeah, uh, an unfortunate tradition to hate the people from that country or from that region. They're, you know, oh, they're from the mountains. We don't talk to them. They live by the, the lake. They're, we don't talk to them. Those are the desert people. Forget them and so on and so forth. Um, why is it taken so long to realize for humanity's sake that we're people and the governments are governments, their wars implement us and we have to go fight for them. But, you know, not realizing that the people on the ground, you know, want to go to school, want to have their, their business, want to have their daily lives and just be left alone. Why has it taken us so long to get there? Well, that's the fundamental question of history, isn't it's it? $64,000 question, yeah. as they say. And it, as you know, in the United States, as we see, we started this film in 2016, and it was right before the Trump administration came into power. And as we're making this film about people fighting for democracy and human rights in Iran, we're seeing those uh, elements push back in our country and, and, and really you know, disregarded. Uh, voting rights disappear when people are fighting for voting rights in Iran. So why is there this cycle of, of misunderstanding of other cultures? I don't know, I don't know. But you know, um, one of the reasons we wanted to do this film was because we were seeing this um, anti-Islam, anti-Iran, um, demonization in the United States for political purposes. And I love the fact that Nazreen is this Muslim woman, you know, raised by conservative parents who uh, is very strong in her own right and has fought over and over and over again for religious minorities and ethnic minorities. Um, and so here's this woman in Iran really showing the world how we should behave. And, you know, we need role models, especially like, as you're saying, because we keep slipping into the same stupid cycle, uh, but it doesn't have to be that way. And, and by the way, just to say, Najmeen's husband, Reza Condon, uh, breaks those stereotypes too. You know, here's this strong, independent, brilliant guy, uh, but he adores his wife and, and will do anything to support her. He's been helping raise the kids when she's in prison. Marsha often refers to him as Nazarene's Marty Ginsburg, you know, to Ruth Peter Ginsburg. And, and so, um, yeah, let's, we can, we, it is possible to break that cycle and they show us that it is. Um, I just want to, you know, because you sort of touched upon it, but I, I want to just, you know, answer my version of that as well to say one thing. Because people ask, like, why did we decide to make a movie about Nazarene? I mean, how did we come across this woman? How did wh why did we do this? So about twelve years ago, Jeff uh, made a film um, called in well, two thousand twelve. It came out. He made a short film for Amnesty International called uh, "Education Under Fire" about the persecution of the Baha'i faith in Iran. Which is, if you know anything about that, that's unbelievably horrendous. And Nazarene, he came across Nazarene at that time, and and I think he was really taken with the idea that. Again, he just brought it up, but that, you know, here's this Muslim woman who's defending her Baha'i, you know, friend, where she could go to prison, you know, herself or be, end up killed in prison herself. But that, that was sort of the genesis of, you know, how we came to know about her and what really, really drew us to her as, a, as to do a larger portrait of her life uh, because uh, she's, you know, she doesn't limit herself you know, to who she represents, she represents for justice. And that's, that's her thing. And, you know, I think one of my really favorite things in the film is she's in the car, and she talks about getting the anonymous phone call. And the guy starts asking her all these questions, you know, are you a Zoroastrian? Are you that, you know, are you that, are you that? A communist or, you know, and then it's like, well, which branch of Muslim? And she just doesn't answer because after a while, what you're doing is, you know, you're never going to be on the right side of what that person wants you to be. And I, and I, and again, I just, Jeff just said it, but I, I want, I do want people to know that that was really one of the driving reasons we wanted to make a film about this one because she really stands out in this way that you brought up. Yeah. And, and one more little favorite thing, if I could mention, which is that there's a sequence with Jafar Panahi, the great internationally acclaimed filmmaker, friend of Nazarene. And, uh, and she's at one point working with him and defending him and trying to get this horrible travel ban and, and, and ban against filming lifted by the authorities. 
And as they're leaving, uh, he says, thank you very much, Mrs. Today. And by the way, you can't do this for free. I insist on paying you. And she says, no, 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 I, I, I don't do everything for free. But the point being that all these, you know, all these cases of, of, of people suffering uh, greatly, Nazarene usually defends them for free. Um, a lot of things that people don't understand about Iran is that Iran is a heterogeneous society. It's not, it's not homogeneous. It's not only Persian and then there's religious divides. There's Azari, there's Assyrians, like, like my family, there's Armenians. Uh, there's a small Arab population and, and so on and so forth. Bahari, Jews. Jews, yeah. Yeah, uh, but, the, but those are religious different. Well, not, not necessarily Judaism, but I mean, Zoroastrianism is, is the original religion of Iran, but they're ethnic Persians and so on and so forth. And like, the Kurds, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and, you know, and the Kurds have their region. Um, and, and so people forget that there are ethnic and religious minorities within what the United States would call ethnic and religious minorities over there. When, when you start touching upon that and people start opening their eyes to it, and then you see someone like Nasreen, what she went through, and so on and so forth the past 40 plus years, and then we see some of the activism over here, and it comes into you know, the bathroom debate or, or certain things that almost seem ridiculous at, at some point. You know, is there a sense of, my God, we complain to complain here in the U.S.? when we see what's really going on over there in, in other parts of the world, like, you know, we see what's going on in Africa, we see what's going on in West Asia and the Middle East and, and in China and whatever else. Like, like, do our concerns almost seem futile in comparison? Uh, very good question. And I would say, yes, compared to a lot of the rest of the world, we have it good here. I mean, yes, but honestly, Anything can happen. And I think for the film, and I felt that, you know, while we were making the film, you know, the last four years of the previous administration and what's happening now is that, you know, those freedoms that we have are precarious and we should pay close attention to what's happening in the world, not to feel superior and not to feel sorry for ourselves, but to realize that democracy is really fragile and it's really easy to be, you know, uh, deceived by authoritarians and that your rights can slowly come away from you and you can end up in these situations. I mean, we've seen it here, you know, and, and it's horrifying. And we, I, I think it's important to realize that, yeah, we have it good, but it's very fragile. Just look around the world. I mean, look at what Iran used to be like, you know, I mean, you know, Syria, you're talking about countries that, you, you know, slow they, they lost everything. Um, you know, sometimes I like to make light of things, especially this is a very heavy topic. And then, you know, we have Saudi Arabia, who's an ally of the United States. And we go back to, to these travel bans, like President Obama set his first, President Trump said, okay, you know, 12 of the 14 are good, I'm going to switch out these two. President Biden still ha has his list and one over the other keeps getting blamed over the, the last three administrations in if we include this one. And then we have Saudi Arabia and then Saudi Arabia recently allowed women to the right to drive. I think that was about a year ago, year and a half ago. Yeah, except that it arrested uh, the women who led the drive, the, the, the protests to get the drive uh, and, uh, and uh, treated them horrendously in prison. We did a, um, a campaign that linked uh, the work of Nazarene and Lujain, Lujain being one of the women activists in, Iran, in Saudi Arabia. Um, calling for the freedom of both of them and having a solidarity between those two countries, Shiite and Sunni, and, you know, supposed ally and supposed enemy, um, the commonality between them uh, and, and how they also represent women all over the world. And, and I think it's important to realize that, yeah, this, you know, governments may choose their allies, but that doesn't necessarily mean that uh, the regimes are worth embracing. Right. That was something I, I was, bring, you know, leading to in that, you know, why, why are we tolerant of one and then suppressive of the other? I understand the hostage situation and the revolution and driving the United States embassy out and everything else that goes along with it. Like I made a joke uh, with, with friends of mine who, uh, who have Middle Eastern backgrounds, you know, when people thought it was this great liberation thing that the women in Saudi Arabia were finally allowed to drive, not realizing that the husband needs to sign off on it or the father needs to sign off on it. And I said, wait a minute, that's going to be 6 million women that are going to be allowed to drive in their pockets of cities. Traffic is going to be horrendous when that happens. And so all the other Middle Eastern people laughed with me, and then other people thought it was some sort of misogynist thing. And I was making a traffic reference, not a, not a women driving reference. Um, when we have that, is it almost 
you know, if people are paying attention, we can understand that it's hypocritical, but it's also political movement. But how do we as individuals justify these two situations with ally versus enemy? And then looking at Yemen, which is facing a famine and treated as a proxy war on top of all of this. Well, first of all, in Saudi Arabia, as far as women being allowed to drive, that really connects to something that Nazreen has said, because Nazreen has, has used the hijab, the mandatory hijab in Iran, as a symbol of oppression of women. Uh, and, and she's pointed out a number of times, it's not enough for the government to say, oh, to give us permission not to wear a hijab, but it has to be uh, written in the law that women are equal and they have their own choice. It's not a gift. It's a right. And the same thing applies to women driving in Saudi Arabia. If it's just a gift that can be yanked away just as easily, it doesn't count. It has to be enshrined in the law, that kind of equality. And, and I think that when you get inspired by someone like Nazreen, you, you realize the universality of human rights. Uh, and then, Marsha and I have said this many times, then you have to apply it to our own country as well. I mean, I think it's really important to criticize other countries and to support activists in other countries, but you have to bring those concerns back to the United States and make sure that we're living up to those standards. Um, I just wanna say from something else for me, you know, when we launched this film um, in October, you know, we, we've been having a global impact and outreach campaign, you know, for the last, you know, now nine months or so. And uh, one thing that has been very moving to me it, through this experience is how many people are out there that are activists, uh, that do care, that are participating, and a lot of young people, you know, who are really active right now. Uh, and, you know, we, we don't hear about them so much. I mean, you know, we hear, you know, when people march for guns, you know, and things like that, like in Parkland, but, you know, there are so many people and organizations in this country and around the world that are really advocating for human rights. And I, you, I did want to answer a question you asked earlier. So when we started making the film, the first thing we asked Nazreen and Reza is this, you know, are you going to be OK? Is this going to be safe for you? You know, because we're not going to do it. And if it's not, if it's not, we're just not. And, you know, and then we will stop at any time. And every time we had meetings with Nesri, you know, kind of this way, that was always the first question. Are you sure you want to go on? Because we'll stop, you know, and then and the other thing, too, is even raising money, we did very, very privately. We didn't do an impact, you know, a crowdsourcing campaign, you know, the way a lot of indie films do because we wanted to keep it as quiet for as long as we can. And then when we finished the film and literally right before we were gonna launch October 1st of last year, you know, we said to Reza Nazreen, you know, if, you're, if you don't want this film to be, come out, we'll just put it away and that'll be that. So, they, you know, there were many opportunities along the way for them to actually say, stop. And they didn't want us to, fact, you know, they've really encouraged us actually. And, um, and again, all the people that participated in the film also signed releases, you know, they knew, you know, but the, you know, it's very heartening to see, you know, what people don't realize is how many activists are really there in Iran. You know, we don't realize that there are people, you know, one thing I loved, you know, when you make a film and you watch the same things over and over and over, you know, all of a sudden you go, wasn't that person in that crowd? You, know, you begin to sort of recognize, you know, what I would call the, you know, the extras, you know, the people out there protesting who show up at every protest, you know, they may, you don't hear them say anything in the film, but they're, they're there. And I think it's important to, that people know that, you know, there are, there is a movement in Iran. No, people aren't being quiet. It's very dangerous. It's very difficult, but they're not, they're, they haven't given up. Um, the, you know, cancel culture has, permeated the United States, whether it's been via Twitter or other social media. And if they don't like something, we've kind of gotten our own version of censorship through social media, where if they don't like what you say, it's done for. Um, but there's also been phrases, and I, and I don't want to make the comparison of Joe Rogan and Nesreen because they're two different planes. But when they tried to cancel Joe Rogan, they couldn't because he was considered too big to cancel. Is Nesreen considered too big to cancel because she's so famous internationally. Like I mentioned Netta from 11 years ago, nobody cared about the village girl, or I'm sorry, the, you know, the local girl from the city protesting that got shot in the throat because somebody more famous died at the same time. So this is squashed, but because she's so important to multiple movements and multiple political figures that it's kind of easier for her not to face 
you know, a death sentence or, or, be, uh, or be assassinated in prison? Well, first of all, thanks for not comparing her to Joe Rogan. <laughs> so, uh, but separate from that, uh, I, I, I think um, the film and Nazarene's public position has protected her to some degree. But you have to look at the way they've treated her uh, to realize how horrendous this judicial system is in Iran. Uh, again, uh, for simply being a good lawyer and defending nonviolent practitioners uh, of uh, democracy, uh, she is facing three decades in prison and still has a sentence of, of of dozens and dozens of lashes as well. She uh, was in solitary confinement for quite some time, not able to see her children. She was held in Nadine prison, a ter terrible place. <clears throat> and then when she went on a 46 day hunger strike, uh, demanding that, uh, that uh, Iranian prisons be cleaned up in, in the wake of COVID and political prisoners be released, they transferred her to Garchak prison, which is notoriously unhealthy. And uh, she got COVID right away. Um, and uh, her whole family ended up getting COVID from it. And so now she's in guard check. She's in this small cell. It's about 13 feet by 10 feet. It, it's, it has a low ceiling. It has about a dozen other prisoners. There's no windows, no ventilation. Uh, there's no protein in their food, salty water, and the place stinks of, uh, of, of sewers. That's, that's where they've stuck her. So um, yes, um, she is still alive and strong and determined, uh, but the regime is doing everything it can to clamp down on her. As a matter of fact, she was on a short medical leave a while back, and when that was canceled, she was sent back to prison. In the car on the way back to prison, she found out that her bank accounts had also been frozen. And that her daughter had been arrested at one point, and her husband uh, is home on, on bail uh, after he was arrested. So uh, it's a terrible regime. And uh, it, and that's why she and others like her deserve our support. And that, you know, there's other crusher. I, I want to say, because I know we have to wrap up, but I want to say something here. You know, I don't know. I, I can't speak for Jeff on this one, but, you know, you know, I go in and out with optimism for the state of the world, which seems like you do as well. But I think I could speak for us when I say that I think we're both idealists and that, you know, we we wouldn't make the films that we make and do what we do because it, these are very difficult films to make and they're very difficult to get them out into the world and to get seen. And, but, you know, if we can do our little part to bring attention to the situation, you, you know, that that's what, we, you know, we've been aiming to do in some way, you know, because the subject matters of all our films, honestly, every one of them are people that, um, you know, we want to bring greater recognition to who do a kind of work that's a great sacrifice, you know, to themselves and their loved ones. And, um, and you know, and maybe they don't always benefit them, but they do ultimately benefit a lot of people around them. You know, Terrence McNally, you know, are the lawyers in the state of marriage, you know, Chick Webb, you know, Father Joseph. All our films are centered around Nazarene, centered around people like this. And I think we do that because we're, ideal, we're idealistic in the fact that, you know, we really want to honor and recognize and make sure that these people are not forgotten, least of all Nazarene, by any history books anywhere. Yeah. And along the way, tell a good story. Um, and I should just mention, of course, that people can uh, find out more about Nazreen, get involved on her behalf of her uh, of her case, and also find out how they can watch the film, including on Hulu, by going to the website www.nazreenfilm.com. Perfect. I know we were going to mention that, you know, the website <laughs> and the social media tags and everything else, because that's yeah. all important as well. Thank um, you. Yeah. Since we are living in the United States. And I know you have another interview after this, so I'm trying not to keep you as, as long as possible. But uh, <laughs> no, this is great. You know, we but we do we have become polarized, whether in reality or what's being presented to us as the far left is the majority on the left side, the far right is the majority on the right side, and those are the only two encampments. There's no purple ground. Everything's either extreme red, extreme blue. When we see what's happening with Nasreen in Iran, when we see what's happening in Africa, when we see what's happening in Saudi Arabia and Yemen and, and China and North Korea and South Korea and everywhere else in the world in between, how do we get back to this sense of middle ground and go, all right, I might disagree with you on X policy, but I still defend the right for you to have that opinion rather than, oh, you disagree with me, women, to hell with you, and I hope your family burns in hell. 
Yeah, I don't think it has to be a middle ground. I think you can still believe as passionately in what you believe in, uh, but just um, um, have an understanding of the humanity of the other side. Um, it is difficult. I mean, I, I used to have this daily radio show in Vermont, and I interviewed a lot of politicians and a lot of, and I always tried to, um, even though I had my own views, I tried to interview uh, and, and respect uh, conservatives, uh, people in the middle of the row, libertarians, liberals, you know, try to have a place where we could communicate. And there's a lot of people who I disagreed with fundamentally politically, but I admired personally, and I loved their patriotism, and I wanted to honor that. I, I do think that there's been this radicalization of this country where one side just refuses to talk to the other. I mean, you know, when you have Mitch McConnell who says, I don't care what the legislation is, if it's from the Biden administration, I'm going to block it. Um, it's very hard to have any kind of accommodation. And so, uh, you know, it's, it's very tricky. I, I hope that um, both sides can find a way to respect each other and realize there's mutual patriotism, but um, that involves both sides. Um, and we may have to have a period of time where we wait things out. Um, I don't know. It's as Marshall was saying before, I think democracy is really a threat. Uh, and I'm, I'm not defending one party over the other, except to say one party absolutely refuses to talk to the other under any circumstances whatsoever. And that makes things very difficult. I would say also for me, I think ultimately more people are moderate than not, by the way. You know, I actually think that. And if you look at things, you know, like mo the majority of people want sensible gun control. The majority of people really don't care whether, or, you know, they, you know, people should have their, you know, transgender and LGBT, the right, you know, it's, it's like people are fine with it because like everybody's like, it's part of our lives now. I mean, and people aren't concerned with those things. They, they're fine about it. I, I really is the majority of, you know, people, I think you've got, you do have these extreme polarizations, but I think the middle ground is, is much bigger than the polar, but the, the problem, you know, is with the, you know, he who speaks the loudest and you got to understand, you know, the media, and, you know, it, a lot of the media is really a, causes of the polarization because in fact, you know, it makes the news, you know, it's boring to talk to a moderate, you know, it's much more interesting to like show, you know, some extreme person here and, you know, and say, oh God, this, you know, AOC said this today, but this one said, you know, but the QAnon did that today, because that's what, you know, makes the headline, you know, that's the sexy news. And right. we, if it bleeds, it leads. Yeah, and, and I really, you know, it's like the squeaky wheel gets the grease, you know, or, you know, it gets the media attention and it gets blown up and it makes the news because really the majority of people just want to go about their lives, you know, and get home safely, you know, I mean, that's all people want to do. And I, I, I really believe that more than anything. And I, I, and, I, and I, you know, and the way that the media, you know, amplified by social media and cable news and I include all cable news, you know, they want, they're in the, for the ratings, you know, they're in it for the, you know, the clicks. And so they put on the, the news that's sexist and that gives you the idea that like, they, they're not more people in the middle. Uh, I also think one other piece, which is that um, we tend to see people in the news, see people in other countries in this abstracted way. And part of that is, is amplified by what Marsh is talking about. And so one of the things we tried to do with Nazreen is here's this person who you might read a sentence about here or there, um, but we really would try to show a human portrait of her at home with her kids, with her husband, you know, going shopping, uh, picking up her son from school, going to the theater, art galleries, which you've never seen in Tehran, but they're there and they're, and, you know, very vibrant, uh, and, and sort of burrow in on a human being and see, oh, there's a full person there. And maybe the answer also to what you're saying is just realize there are full people everywhere and you have to uh, take a moment to peel away uh, the veneer and, and look inside. And I always find the common humanity that we all share. Everybody, sh we're, you know, we're all people mm -hmm. as Terrence, what does Terrence McNally say? You know, we're all people and we have to recognize that we really share so much, so. You know, uh it, it kind of reminds me going back and studying history, which a lot of people don't know about it, the Christmas Eve, the Christmas Eve uh, truce uh, in World War I, which almost ended the war where France, Scotland, you know, uh, well, the United Kingdom, you know, Scotch and England and the Germans came together and they actually had their chaplains come out and they celebrated Christmas Mass together and Christmas Day 
they played soccer and celebrated. And then all of a sudden the generals and, and the government officials go, all right, Christmas is over, get back to it. You know, it, it seems like that's the level of lunacy that we've gotten to. And then November 11th at the 11th hour, you know, war is supposed to, the war was supposed to end. And they're like, well, at 6 a.m., keep shelling for the next five hours. And it was the bloodiest massacre of the entire World War I battles in Europe. Um, you know, where do we rediscover our humanity then if we're too busy focusing on either the written declaration of XYZ, like again with World War I, or, you know, they're on paper our enemy, they're on paper are our allies. So who cares about the human condition and what's going on over there like if like say a war breaks out over there oh it's expected from those people you know a bombing in france happens it's a tragedy that sort of thing well i mean again these are fundamental questions and and, and not easy and ones that have been wrestled with for a millennia um as marcia was saying one of the delights of this project despite the fact that it seems so gloomy sometimes is that we've connected with so many people who are courageous and warm and caring we did this event about two weeks ago uh, um, with Nazarene, with Lujane from Saudi Arabia, about Lujane from Saudi Arabia, and it was sponsored by Amnesty International and the RFK Human Rights Center in Penn America, but, and it also involved six or seven other women from other parts of the world sharing their stories of human rights, and so all these women from all over the world, you know, fighting for something similar, and also just so incredible, these amazing women, and uh, there's a lot to be inspired by. And then going back to Nazreen, one of the things I love about her uh, is that she just loves culture. She said this at one point in the film, uh, sometimes you know, when being a human rights lawyer becomes too heavy and I just can't stand any longer. I, I have to go do something in the arts with my kids. So I'll go to an art gallery, I'll go to the movies, I'll go to the theater. And yeah, there's humanity in all those places. We just have to look through it. And, and I, you know, even mentioned Joe Rogan, we're bombarded by, um, by opinions all the time. And I think maybe we need to take more control of our opinions and, and, and try to form our own sense of the world, not have it be dictated to us by someone else. All of its opinions really in some fashion, I guess. True. I don't know, you know, in the state of marriage, our, our movie about the early pioneers of the marriage equality movement, uh, these incredible small town Vermont lawyers, uh, uh, you know, Beth Robinson and Susan Murray and, and Mary Bonato, you know, what does Beth say, you know, at the very end, you know, these are your friends and neighbors, you know, it was like a person to person, you know, after a while, somebody knew somebody who knew somebody and they got to know their neighbors, so to speak. Well, Beth says at the end of that film, uh, which is about marriage equality and small town Vermont lawyers, but not dissimilar from Nazarene on some level, she says, if you can change people's hearts, you can change people's minds. And it's a person-to-person -person thing. Anyway, we must, I think it's time for us to go. But it's been great to talk to you. It's such an interesting conversation. We didn't expect it to be so political, but it's interesting. Well, it is a political conversation. We can't give away too much of the documentary because we want people to watch it on June 15th, which is two days after the three-year anniversary of Nesreen's imprisonment. So there's that whole tie-in of timing to everything. I mean, you guys were part of New York Docs tw uh, 2020, yes, as much as you her. could be, Denver, so on and so forth. And now, you know, everything that's going along with it that we have to get people to want to watch it because it's it's horrible to give the whole documentary without people seeing it. Can I say one little last thing though about Nesrin, if that's okay? Um, which is that, you know, all this sounds very serious and it is, and you mentioned that, but one of the things that's so delightful about Nesrin is her sense of humor. You know, she has a, a, a smile that could light up, you know, a, a, a cavern and, uh, and, and she's just so caring. When you talk to her in person, you know, she's always laughing. She's always asking about how your kids are doing. And so uh, this is not a grim film. Uh, it's really a film that's animated by that bright spirit. And that's why we want to free that bright spirit and get her back out in the world. Uh, one thing that Middle Eastern people are notorious for uh, that people don't know other than you know, what they see on the news is that we tend to find humor within tragedy. So it's great that she has a sense of humor about this and I'm happy to see it. The documentary is absolutely phenomenal. There are political figures, there's Nesreen herself, there's all sorts of things that are going on in this documentary that people really need to see because it humanizes her, it humanizes Iran, it humanizes all these other things that are going on that people don't necessarily realize outside their own circle. Uh, the website is nesreenfilm.com, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, Nesreen Film. 
Jeff Kaufman, Marshall Ross, thank you so much for your time. I greatly appreciate it. I know I kept you longer than, than we had intended and you're so it was worth today, it. but I appreciate it. <laughs> thank what you so that, much. We're so glad. Have Take care. Bye. Thank you.